welcome back to the fashion lab let's talk about katherine hewitson and her brand pristine pristine is a brand started by katherine hewitson in 2021 and the look is very much punk fetish kitsch old hollywood glamour all mixed into one she has dressed julia fox olivia rodrigo courtney kardashian rosalia with over a decade in fashion katherine has a lot of experience before building pristine she was working with some of london's most noteworthy brands Catherine has just launched a new website and restructured her way of working and the pieces that she has to offer. In this interview, she gives us the full breakdown on the wholesaling game, being a truly sustainable brand and producing quality clothes that will stand the test of time. Enjoy the episode and stay till the end for a close-up look at the construction of her new Chasha corset. Let's go talk to Catherine. I've made it, I've landed in the pristine world. I'm in the pristine studio here with Catherine. She is the brains behind everything fabulous you can see around us. How are you? Yeah, good. <laughs> yeah, good actually. A year ago I said bad, six months ago I'd probably been like, I'm not sure. Okay. No, I think I'm good. That's good, I like to hear that. I'm glad that things are looking up. Coming out the other side, yeah. So one thing that I noticed, I first noticed when I discovered your brand, I think I discovered your brand maybe like a year ago maybe a bit longer. And the thing that I noticed the most, and especially when I come in here, is like, you have such a clear design style, like a visual style. And I felt like when I came here to pick up samples the other day, I was like, the posters, like the shoes, everything makes sense. And then the way you dress for work, like you came tottering down in your little spike <laughs> mules and your pedal pushers. Like it's very, like you live the look. Um, what are your inspirations? I think it's always been the same kind of stuff to be honest I'm not like a I've never really been like a kind of conceptual kind of designer it's always a lot of it just based on the stuff I've always like really loved and just wanted to kind of fill my world and my wardrobe I guess everyone else is with like <laughs> cool shit um I mean I've always been a big fan since I was a teenager of like punk music and like subculture that's always like an influence and then there's always elements of like old Hollywood or like movies from various different eras there's elements of kind of like fetish influences and it's always very much kind of such a cliche to say oh the empowered woman but it's kind of like more just like the girl that wants to like it sounds like an oversimplification just like fucking feel hot and like have fun but like for herself not for someone else you might have like your tits up here and you might be like wearing a tiny tiny skirt but like doesn't mean you want to like doesn't mean you're available, it's because like you think you look fucking great and you mm -hmm. just are enjoying yourself. So this is why I'm your demographic. <laughs> <laughs> because that's exactly what I want out of an outfit. I think it thrills my inner child a little bit because it's all the stuff you kind of discover when you're me a teenager. Too, to be honest. <laughs> you really give it up. Um, it's almost like what womanhood looks like from a younger perspective, but then you, you get to like create yourself and do it. So yeah, well, it's I think, really fun. Oh, I'm glad. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, it's always really nice when you hear people say that and it like comes across. And I think the thing is that I find quite frustrating is that as a woman, when you like are into stuff that's considered like the kind of things that are for like little girls, it's always seen as like weird and like you're not allowed to like some of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And then it's like for little boys, they're allowed to like grow up into men and still like like, I don't know, cars and tractors. But like <laughs> if you grow up as a woman and you obviously like more adult things, but then also, you know, might appreciate a fucking weird old teddy bear or like whatever it's seen as like weird because of everyone else like sexualizing you, but it's not always about that. Sometimes you're just allowed to like, well, this is cute and then this is fun and this is pretty. And it's like, you can, why can't you just curate this world of your own that's without other people deciding it's like strange and yeah. I get you. <laughs> I, I, I feel you. I feel what you're saying. Um, it's almost just seen as like frivolous and exactly. stupid and like bimboish, but yeah. those are good things. Well, exactly. I think and we like, all need some frivolity in our life every this day. This is the thing, the world's <laughs> like too miserable for us to not have a bit of joy, but then also things that are kind of be frivolous and bimboish, but also like really beautifully made and wonderfully crafted and like not every like bimbo wants to shop at like pretty little thing. That is uh, like, <laughs> that on a scroll. Exactly. <laughs> So what was your like journey into design like? I so I grew up in West Cumbria, near the Lake District, it's not in the Lake District, in like a little kind of tiny village, kind of council estate, like no one in my family had ever moved away, gone to uni, all that stuff. And for whatever reason, as like a tiny little kid, I was always like, I wanna be a fashion designer, I wanna be a fashion designer. Don't really know where it came from. Um obviously my parents were like, I don't think really knew what to say or do or didn't have any kind of point of reference for it really. 
Um, and I was also like quite like, academically like good at school, it just like maths and science and all that stuff always came really naturally to me. So my parents and my school were very like pushy of like, oh yeah, you should like go and study maths. They were pushes of trying to get me to like go to Cambridge or something like that, which is just like, I've always basically been the same person as I am now, like for better or worse. <laughs> but I always knew I wouldn't belong in a place like that. Um, so there was quite a lot of like conflict and shit when I was a teenager about it. It was quite troubling. My like sixth form art teacher and like the final parents evening of everything like changed my life basically. Like just turning around and we just came from like talking to the like the maths uh, teacher who you know was really great and you know whatever. But he was sort of oh she could do this she could do that blah 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 blah. And it was probably like a week or something before like the UCAS deadline. And at this point everything was still very like tense and I was like really really depressed <laughs> at that point and I was like crying at school. And, and I sat down with my mum and dad, with my art teacher, and she just turned around and I'd never talked about this to her. I don't know if her friends had or anything. We just sat down and she just looked at my parents and she said, I think Catherine would be an amazing fashion designer. And I just, as you can imagine, just like broke down. And then they had this very tense conversation. And then we went home and had much more tense conversations wow. with my parents being like, you told her to say, I was like, I had no idea. But over the course of this evening, eventually it kind of, they kind of came round and I guess we're just a bit like fuck it let's see what happens kind of thing and but like but you're not going to London <laughs> okay so I went to uni in Newcastle at Northumbria and um, I found it really really hard to be honest I don't think that's where I'm at my like best is like when I'm in like an educational environment mm -hmm. I think I really thrive when I'm like doing and figuring it out and um, so as part of that course you did like a placement year so 2011 thousand years ago makes me feel really old um i was down here for like nine months i was interning with roxander and that was when her company oh, wow. was like really tiny and she really personally like took me under her wing and it felt like so magical and i was like oh my god this world i've always wanted to be a part of and i was like helping with like the designer stuff and i was going with her like on shoots and it was this so amazing thing when you find yourself in this world that you kind of dreamed of but weren't ever really fully quite sure if it existed or what it was like and you're like this is like what I want to do um but then kind of going back to uni and going into final year and all of that it was I was so desperate to kind of get back into doing it um so I kind of graduated it was fine like my final collection was kind of like the best kind of stuff I did at uni I'm kind of a bit embarrassed of it now but like if it wasn't for like the good intention of my tutors it was actually the only kind of module that uni actually passed. Everything else was kind of just like, oh, like they could see that I was like trying and cared and I just, and I really was really trying and really cared. I think I cared too much that I struggled to meet the kind of marking criteria and like all of that, so anyway. <laughs> well, it's, it's different from actually doing, being a designer, just like crossing off modules. Exactly, and I always really struggled with that, so I'm like, I just, I want to make this thing that I believe in and I want to do this and I was over to overthink like one certain element and mm -hmm. kind of they were really set up towards like giving people a career in like high street brands and they had relationships with a lot of bigger kind of like American companies like people would go on and work at like Abercrombie or at like Levi's and Gap and it was just like you don't realise when you're like 17, 18 that when you choose a uni to go to for something like fashion that's a part of it is like figuring out well what type of fashion job do you want to have and I'm like a 17 year old I don't know. It is I didn't even know anything about the industry <laughs> yet. Yeah, it is quite wild that you're so, like at such a young age we're supposed to make all these big decisions. And... You don't realise the consequences of it. And so I kind of moved down here when I graduated, started working like pubs and shops. Started um, interning right at the very end um, for a brand called Mead and Kirchhoff, which loads of people haven't heard of now. I don't know why like the kids on TikTok haven't like lost their minds over me and Every like, like couple of months they come into my head and I start looking for them on all the like vintage and stuff just to see what's about. That show they did with the rainbow hair that was like, I remember bleaching my friend's hair and trying to recreate that um, from the catwalk show. <laughs> but that's, it's that same kind of like, you know, like magic of feeling mm. like, oh, but they were like, everyone was obsessed. Yeah, um, it was, they were a big deal at the time. It was amazing. Now like, you say that, it makes sense actually. You're just like. I can see you there. That makes sense. To yeah, me. no, and I loved it, and it was really intense. It was crazy. It was like I was there. It was like started as an internship, sort of changed, turned into like a sort of job, but not because they were like let go of all their staff, and then I was just like, oh, I guess I'm gonna try and help you like stay going. So I was running their like studio and production stuff for a while. That was like right at the very end, and it all kind of culminated in us getting 
kicked out the studio to the landlord changed the law. I guess it was a very kind of early realization which they go oh, there is multiple more of of like how challenging it actually is to manage to mm -hmm. succeed in this industry they had so much support and they had so much like so many huge fans and all this attention and it still isn't enough to give, get some degree of stability um from there i then went and worked for a knitwear brand called Sibling, which again, <laughs> this no is all from the past. Right. <laughs> um, and that was really, really great. It was more of like a kind of desk job. Like I was kind of dealing with all the factories that were producing all the knitwear. It was all mainly like fully factored. So when it's produced overseas, just doing tech packs and cards and lots of emails. And I really missed being like hands on. Um, and that was also quite intense in its own way because Sibling was uh, founded by the three kind of friends. It was like Sid and Joe and Cosette. And Joe, unfortunately, was very, very unwell. And he actually passed away in the time that I was there. Wow. Which was obviously really, and by no means am I saying it was hard, like unimaginably hard for, especially Sid, because they were a couple and it was like so tragic. Um, But, you know, mm. that's life, I guess. Life just seems to be more intense than you realize. Yeah, absolutely. Um, from there I went and worked doing a similar job but in a bit of a more like hands-on way because everything was kind of mainly made in London um, for Ashley Williams. Um, loved that for a while, things were good. I felt really excited, I thought I was finally in this place where I was like, oh, you know, things felt like they were like thriving, we were like, massively increasing sales from season to season and I was like oh because it was always my goal to like learn how it's done from somebody else I always knew I wanted my own thing eventually but I was like okay let's suss out you know building this business <laughs> and how it kind of works what you should and do so that I'm doing it with somebody else um and then about I can't remember how far into working for Ashley I got breast cancer <laughs> and so as crazy as to say, for a while, kept working through that because as a 25 year old, you don't really realize that some things you don't just kind of crack on and plow through, which now you're like, yeah, that was mental. <laughs> wow. it, it was really hard. It was really hard. Unfortunately, that relationship kind of went to shit <laughs> in the nicest way possible. I walked away from that, kind of walked away from the whole industry for a while and was kind of took a lot of processing, a lot of figuring out. Unfortunately, none of the time I could not work. I ended up spending a few years out working in a cafe and just trying to get my head straight and recover and all. Had several years of kind of dealing with the kind of aftermath and recovering and all this. Fortunately, you know, I'm fine now, wow. I think. I have been for a, a while at this point, but you're never really fine after these things mentally, if nothing else. Well, um, it's, a, it's a huge thing to go through. The amount of people were you tried to talk to them about it even you know medical professionals they would put me with like counselors and all this and people would just constantly be like i don't know what to say to you this is like so sad and i'm like you're like i know nah, <laughs> what are you fucking telling me <laughs> um so it's such a weird one to be in such like a and the sc sad scary thing is it kind of seems that actually even just in the few years since then at the time, you'd never really hearing about people in their twenties kind of getting cancer, and now you kind of seem to be hearing it more, which is scary. It's yeah, another story. I guess it's hard to tell if it's more common or if, or if people are just talking about it. And that too, which is obviously which is, a, good be a good thing. thing yeah, because with a lot of mental health and of course physical health, uh, maybe it's just been more open. Yeah, which you know, if there had been people talking about it more at the time, I probably would have coped with it a bit better because it is like really isolated. I was about to say, yeah, I'm yeah. sure it was. Yeah. so <laughs> anyway from there I was so conflicted about if I you know I knew deep down I wanted to be back in fashion I made a collection actually and was like maybe I'm gonna like do my own thing not I didn't shoot it in the end didn't do anything with it nothing came of it you know but it wasn't the right time I eventually got a job working in a vintage company and I was kind of managing the team there that was doing all of the like reworking stuff and upcycling things like that and had these like grand visions of what it could kind of be. But I did kind of come out of that with this new understanding and kind of say an interest feels like such a meek way of saying it, but like around like sustainability and the ethics of it all. I went into that job knowing it was gonna be my like last job mm -hmm. before I did my own thing, but 
I think it did actually really help form the approach I was going to have to this, like more than I realised it was at the time in my head. I was like, oh, it's just another job like back in fashion. And oh yeah, at least I'm not like, you know, making coffee all day, every day again. Like, but it did actually really help me get my head around what my values were when it came to like making clothes and stuff because you don't always think about stuff like that until you're put in a position where you need to and then it makes sense. Yeah, 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 it makes sense, it makes sense. Not just Christine in 2021. I'd spent about a year or so before that just like gradually like working on pieces, waiting to like get paid for my job or figuring out something I can find that I can sell to like buy some more fabric so I can make the next piece. And then kind of miraculously it kind of took off really quite quickly, which was great. And then it became my full-time job like right away. Like the, I launched and kind of quit my job at the same time. Yeah, it's been a kind of whirlwind ever since, to be honest. And That's amazing. It is, but also at the same time, I really kind of wish I'd done it differently. People are so scared to quit because they think they're going to be broke is like the main thing, or they're not going to have no work, or they're going to be like just lost. And I think everyone I know, including myself, that's quit a job, it's like all your opportunities come at once. <laughs> Yeah. You always have to be ready for the opposite of what you're scared of when you quit a job. I feel like the it was universe is like, right, you wanna you wanna do your own thing? Here's like Deep end. Yeah. Go. I mean I think the thing is like I never had like a well paying job. I've never been in a position where I had very much money, so it didn't really feel like there was a huge amount to lose. I'm like, worst case I'm gonna like worry about how I'm gonna pay my rent, but like I always worry about that anyway. So. Yeah, I hear you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but no, unfortunately, that wasn't an issue. But at the same time, I guess the other side of that coin is that like looking back, I really wish I'd started the brand with a bit more money behind it. Um, and had it been in a situation where I, early on and still now, it's comes in and out of phases, but make the majority of the stuff myself. At the start, it was because I had to. Mm -hmm. And I guess now it kind of still is because you don't really understand like cash flow and how all this stuff works until you're kind of in the middle of it and you're like, and even then you don't really understand it because you're just like panicking and like treading water and like, uh -huh. But the fact that I had the skills and what I have to do, it meant I could, but it's been really intense and exhausting and my back hurts and mm. I, I really feel like I'm not in my best being sat at a sewing machine all day. So is that your next thing you want to try to rectify is I figure out? I've been years. <laughs> like genuinely, I've been saying that for years. <laughs> the other side of it is that, you know, when you're not making large numbers of stuff, which I don't really want to, and you're mainly dealing with manufacturing in the UK, it's really, really expensive. Mm. I can also personally, and I guess this is a blessing and a curse at the same time, like make stuff well, like pretty quickly. So then I'll get quotes from factories and be like, oh, you're gonna, that's gonna cost 300 quid for the making of that dress. And that's not including fabric strings, so that's like literally purely the sewing. And they'll do a beautiful job. But I kind of had the realization last year with some of these pieces, that I was like, oh, I can actually do it as that well. And I'll do it in like four or six hours. So can I justify it? You would think by the sounds of that, that would then mean that I've got this like stash of money in the bank. I don't because I don't have a, seems I'm not very good at running a business, but I don't know if maybe I am because I've got this far, but like, you I don't are, know. but you're learning. And I think yeah. And I'll never make the same mistakes again, but then you find yourself just making whole new ones. I don't think anyone just starts a company in the first like 10 years and just like, oh, it's fine, I've made no mistakes, I'm rich. Like, I don't think that's how it works. So no, I think but you, usually they are rich already, so none of and that's yeah, an unless, issue. Unless they're rich to begin with, but, but they're just doing a job for fun. Exactly. <laughs> but I never had that option. I always had to make money from it. Like, yeah. it has paid my bills since the start. I've not but really that's had amazing. a lot left, but... But that's like incredible. Like not a lot of people can say that from the start of their business they've been no. paying their bills, which is like the main thing that we need to be doing to survive. So you launched in 2021. Yeah. One thing that I've wanted to ask you, I don't know why I've never just asked you, how did you get the name? Because I love it. I know people always say nowadays, which is like SEO or whatever, like you should just like make up a word and it's why all these like tech companies have this like silly name that's mm -hmm. just like eight random like letters. I really like when something is like a pre-existing word um, and I kind of like that it, I always say this sounds so silly, sounds like, I don't know, it's like a brand of like fridges from the 50s, like, I don't know. <laughs> or like the detergent or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. But then it kind of, I guess, at the same time kind of ties into this whole idea of, you know, like what is being pristine and what is perfect and what does it mean to be like a woman and what is fine and what's not fine. I knew for a fact I didn't want to use my own name because I've seen how likely it is that it all fucking comes crashing down and <laughs> even though I don't want that to happen and I'll do anything with my power if that not be the case. I feel like there's a real kind of pattern in a lot of times when people use their own name for a brand. It is more often in that idea of it being a bit of like a 
the vanity project and it being like you know the cool hobby that doesn't really make the money it's like so tied to them i do quite like the separation and i should be better at the separation because i've seen the way it can kind of eat people up inside Mm -hmm. and i would like to try and have some kind of healthy distance i definitely don't (laughs) but but, um, i love the honesty though i don't want to like be my whole life at the same time like what do i kind of do I just think it's that great quest for like work-life balance that nobody has. Especially if it's your own like passion project and your own like business, your own thing. Like the the brain just keeps going, the ideas keep coming, and it's very hard to switch it off. Which is a good sign because it means you love what you do and it's authentic and it means you're a true creative. But the flip side of that is like, where is the brain space and the life space? Exactly. Exactly. Um, It would be great if we could just like exist in a bubble of our work and our ideas, but like. No, exactly. That's the the yeah the great hurdle, I guess. No, a hundred percent. And I guess when you love it, then because I've so many times I've been like, oh, I need like a hobby to try and like switch off. But the problem is, this is the thing I like doing more than anything else. Yeah, it's like what are you gonna do? Like this is your work and your business and your passion, and then it's like, oh, my hobby. I'm gonna sew like a different colour dress. Well, exactly. <laughs> like, I'm gonna say to my boyfriend, oh, maybe we should start like a menswear brand. And in my head, I'm like, oh, yeah, that'll just be fun. Or that'll be like really commercial and we'll make loads of like a money from that. It won't be just like so <laughs> This is not the answer. Just start making like puppets or something. Just like... We have had that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> but I saw your post about running workshops. Is this one of your hobbies? <laughs> Puppet workshop, no. Um, I mean, there's been a few things that have happened over the kind of time I've done this that really is quite eye-opening of how little I think both like our audience but also I think the public more generally how little kind of idea they have about what goes into like making clothes um like I've had instances in the past where I've had pieces like ripped off and we've done like side by sides of like our look and the kind of sheen and people be like this one's better quality like you're crazy I saw this and I had, to, I had to archive it because it was really hurting my brain for a while. Not because I'm like, I'm not saying it's everyone's taste. It's not actually my favourite piece of made by a long shot either. But you can't look at that and look at that. And it's a sign that you, you're, you, that you don't know. Yeah. Because... Loud and wrong. Some things are objectively true. And what I can say is objectively true is that this fits her better. It's better constructed. It looks more flattering. Yeah, it might be a fucking silly outfit. But like construction wise, comparing the two silly outfits, well, this one is better. Did you but, see that she and have just tried to sue Timu for ripping them off? It's so close to being <laughs> aware. Of course. That cracked me up. But yeah, the workshops. Yeah, so you start kind of think, what can you do to make people be, you know, understand it a bit more? And I know it's obviously a super small scale kind of approach to it, but to kind of get people together and just have a bit of this kind of like introduction to what the process is is of making stuff because there is so much more to it than I think people realise even making something really basic like even trying to plan out what we do in a pretty kind of simple kind of beginner workshop you're like oh that can we do that in that space of time it even makes you realise the complexity of it Mm. Um, and whether that makes people kind of appreciate more you know the price that things can cost or even with some people might plant a seed for them to then want to kind of get into the industry themselves because I do really think the process of making stuff, I don't want to be glued to a sewing machine forever, but I also do really, really value that skill. And I hate the way that in this country, like it's really not fucking valued. Mm. And the manufacturing industry in this country has just been completely decimated. And you look at the way that, for example, like France as a country, they really celebrate and nurture their like fashion industry and not just like the designers, but the craftspeople and everything. And I think it's really, really important to, like, when you feel like you have, like, a tangible skill. I don't know, I think it's nice for people to feel like they've got, like, they know how to do things. Yeah, yeah. I think it's, I'm so amazed by people that can sew because I'm not good at that. Um, And I've been really enjoying the posts you've been doing that are showing, like, how you've levelled up your old designs. And, like, I just love, like, reading about construction and, like, seeing the things because I don't know how to do it. So it's so, like, impressive to me. But I'm glad that your stuff is very well made. Translates as well. Yeah. um, I want it to be. (laughs) Yeah. And even, like, I um, wore a few of your looks for for a shoot recently. And they are, like, very well made. The new pieces are only going to be... And this is why I'm so excited. Let's stuff. talk about that. So yeah. you've, like, rearranged your brand. You've been a bit mysterious about it online, but there's new stuff coming. And that's why I had to message you, like, you're doing something new, and I want to get the, the exclusive. 
the new pristine, I guess, isn't that different from like the original pristine. <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> it's at the same time. It's like sometimes you have to do things that I just crossed my lips the wrong way. <laughs> I've been teaching Etika. <laughs> Sometimes you, uh, I guess, need to do things the wrong way to realise it's not the way you want to do things after seeing the impact it has on like other places I've worked on all this. That like, I didn't want to wholesale. I didn't want to be a part of that. I didn't want to be caught up in this cycle of like collections and this calendar. And then when it was less than a year after the brand had existed, and I got approached by a buyer from Essence, and they wanted this exclusive for a few seasons, and the orders they were placing with me were like huge like too big to say no to and all felt very very exciting and then so that kind of starts happening and I'm like oh I guess I wholesale now so you're like okay so may as well like when the exclusivity with them ended started kind of reaching out to a few other stores and picking things up and kind of I've got pieces in some really great stores but and maybe this will change with the way that I think everyone's realizing the kind of wholesale cycle kind of needs to shift and that tiny brands can't be expected to operate in the same way as like Gucci this pace and this this expectation of churning it around, churning it around with little to no deposit and no kind of real team to speak of. And I was making pieces that I wasn't fully happy with, that was constantly worrying about the the selling price of it, because when you have to take into account those wholesale margins, that's like a fixed thing across the industry that like your cost price to your wholesale price is supposed to be like two, two and a half times. As a small brand, when you're making tiny numbers, you probably often can't really get away with that because by the time you then multiply it up, you're like, oh, that's too much. <laughs> and then to retail price, it'll be like 2.8-ish times again. So people see your stuff selling, they'll have something selling for like 800 quid and obviously think you're like raking it in. But with that, the amount of money you receive from it, it's like tiny, tiny. Mm -hmm. But then to make the pieces that I wanted to make that are these beautifully made, beautifully kind of constructed, like amazing things, when you have to factor in those wholesale margins, like it puts them just out of reach of like the vast, vast majority of people. And you try and get your head around like, where is your willing to compromise? And the thing is the quality just isn't somewhere where I am. And I kind of, it's like you look at the whole kind of like landscape or you'll wander around like a big department store or browse online or whatever and see even the big, big brands, everything is just made of like cheap, nasty fabrics. Mm. And I want to make stuff that kind of like makes your mouth water. I want to make stuff that's like beautiful and also want to use mainly, yeah, natural fibers or dead stock or whatever. And I want to make stuff that is like flawlessly executed and will be there as best as I can. <laughs> and will, you know, be there in 50, 100 years time and someone's going to like dis discover it in their granny's attic or whatever and be like, what is this? And most of the shit that people are churning out nowadays, like, you'd be lucky if it survives till next year. I'm harsh, I know, I'm sorry, but like I'm not, I don't, I don't want to be a part of that. I understand and I look at brands sometimes that you see blow up out of nowhere and think, oh, you know, like I probably could be like raking in the cash if I was making like digital print mini skirts, but like I'm not gonna. And then so instead I found myself in this kind of middle ground where I'm kind of sort of compromising on this, but then not compromising on that and realizing I've just got to kind of go for it. Mm -hmm. And I have all these ideas and all these like amazing things that I want to do and if the thing I have to let go of, at least for the time being, is the kind of wholesale side of it and sticking to this calendar and instead be like, okay, some of these pieces that I'm gonna release, some of them I've been working on for like the best part of a year. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, working on tweaking the pattern, tweaking the fit, doing so many like construction tests, trying different things, trying to source the perfect fabric. Because again, when it's like dead stock, there's a blouse I really wanna make and I had this perfect, amazing dead stock fabric in mind the day I went to order it, literally someone bought it before my oh. eyes and I'm still not over it and I can't find the perfect thing to ref but this is the, the nature of it, you know? I wanna do more special, limited things and I wanna collaborate with like fun, cool people that are really great at what they do and make stuff that is more limited and more special, you know, doing more kind of repurpose things from various vintage or whatever and I just want everything to feel special and it might be that we do release a little kind of drop of something every now and again some of it might be one of ones some of it will be made to order I guess every now and again little some things will be stuck when it's suitable for the piece mm -hmm. but it just needs to be I feel like the pieces need to come first and also my own sanity needs to come first because I always 
definitely losing. Yeah, no, I respect it. Have you confirmed any, like when you say collaborators, you just mean in terms of who you're working with or are there like brands you want to do crossovers with or people? I mean, I would if they, if they, if they want it. Yeah, no, <laughs> that intrigued me. I was like, do you have any I... you can talk about or no? No, I mean, <laughs> more so I'm just like, oh, you know, a few quid would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> but no, at the same time, you're always so conflicted about that because you would never want to like water down the vision, but at mm-hmm. the same time, I'm also aware everything I'm saying, even trying to ignore those wholesale margins, some of these pieces that I'm talking about will still end up being more expensive than some of the stuff I've done before. And you would love to have the more kind of entry level options available to someone or, you know, other categories of pieces I would absolutely love to do that you don't have the resources to or whatever, whether it's shoes or sunglasses, I would love to make. but. Also, you have to try to be I patient. I see you doing shoes. Do you know what? When I walked in here last time, I was looking at all the shoes up here, and you have such good taste in the shape of a shoe. Like the shape of a shoe is so important, and you get it. Well, this is what like the heel so... has to be close to the waist. You know, like I would love to see pristine shoes. The same. That's <laughs> <laughs> really. Put but it's that so out expensive there. to do it on your own because yeah. you know we'd want custom lasts and all this, yeah. and it's like I don't have the money. Yeah. If anyone does. But let's so, put that out know? there so like I can buy them and then also be more poor. Um, but look great. <laughs> I also really love, I think that you can kind of, you can imagine how the brand could kind of apply to different kind of products. Well, this is what I was saying earlier, it's like the identity of your brand is so strong that when you say these things that you want to do, I can see it in my mind's eye, which is like a really big compliment actually. I think as a brand, you want to have that recognisable element, which you definitely have. No, I'm glad. And that's it without me, you've not seen it pushed yet. Do you know Mm. what I mean? I feel like there's so many brands out there now, and especially even the bigger brands, so much of what they do is like, oh, that person's like bag selling really well, let's just make our version, or yeah. that coat's really trendy, let's make our version of that, and I don't want that. And I have so many ideas of my own before I would even dream of starting to copy other people's that you're like, I'm just, it, I hope I have the, you know, the time and the resources and the energy and the whatever to, you know, to realize these ideas. I think that's what makes me yeah. so excited. I, I hope you do too, because I want to see them. <laughs> I'm such a fan, I love it. I'm such a fan of everyone I talk no. to. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, put the ideas out. More, more. Yeah, it's just so many things. I've got a sketch which is full of like things. And even funnily enough, actually, some of the pieces in the the collection I'm kind of releasing at the moment. I say collection, it's like kind of collection, it's kind of not. It's like, like call it's it a like, capsule. I guess, yeah. <laughs> some of them are like ever so slightly tweaked from drawings I literally did like seven, eight years ago and they'd never actually done it. And they've changed a little bit, but it's kind of quite reassuring and nice in a way that then you make these things that's like like I kind of said I think to a degree I've always been kind of the same and I actually think that like child me and teenage me and 25 year old me I think they'd all really really like pristine and that kind of makes me feel nice it's so cheesy no, but it's, I understand it I, I feel the same way about a lot of stuff that I do I get it yeah I know that feeling of just like you've just always been like this and you've just got to wait for your life to catch up with it. Yeah. <laughs> you've already touched on some of the challenges that you face um, running your brand. What do you think is the most rewarding side? I guess, you know, being able to spend my time like, you know, like making cool shit. <laughs> I feel like the the part of this that then you, is the kind of logical next step would be, oh, I'm seeing people wearing it. I so rarely do. <laughs> and I've sold a lot of stuff over the years. Um, and this sounds made up here. But genuinely yesterday was the first time, other than like a friend, someone I know, yesterday was the first time I've like seen someone wearing something in a while. What were they wearing? Um, like a little like barbed wire print skirt from like, like literally like the second like little kind of like collection that I did. And I was took the dog outside of the studio to, just, to do his business and literally walked out the gates and then like looked over there and I was like, is it? And this girl must have been like, oh fuck, she's staring at me for. And then she came towards it, I was like, yeah, and then started like walking behind him, like, like took a little photo and talked to my boyfriend. No, I thought about it, and it's just like, what would you say? And then you're oh, like, Oh, I want to know. I'd be like, So I made your skirt, like, where did you buy it? Like, do you like it? I, sh- I really should. I mean, I need to be better at that stuff. I really should be more confident, just be like, just like own it, you know? Because I was like, I was having a bit of like a shitty day yesterday, and then that really kind of like improved my mood. Yeah, the idea that like. I mean, most of the people that buy stuff, honestly, the vast majority of my sales are like to the US. So I guess I just need to go over there. And I sometimes think when I look at the, the like back end of the website, I'm like, I feel like you must be walking through the streets of Brooklyn and just everyone is wearing something from Pristine. I'm like, I need to like go and just like, cause uh, you're international, you should. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) It's kind of nice to feel like you have some more kind of like tangible, like real life kind of touch points, you know, like the idea of doing 
I don't know, more pop-ups or events or like whatever. I don't fully know, just like some some kind of real things in places. I think that would be cool because the way it seems from the outside when I look at your like socials and stuff, it seems like there's quite like a pristine crowds and like the places that I see it and the magazines I see it in. So I feel like if you did something, you'd probably be surprised at how busy it was. No, I think it'd be nice. It's definitely gonna come. It's oh, I love it. Come. We're gonna we're gonna get to the pieces in a minute. <laughs> I'm like itching to see them. Um, but I wanted to also. I said that this is so difficult. I said it at the start. Do not let me forget to ask you this question, and then we're at the end, and I'm like, oh, that question. <laughs> Um, you do your own fabrics, like a lot of your own prints. Yeah. And I think it's so cool. Oh, thank you. Because I knew that, and like obviously the t-shirts and stuff, I knew that they were printed, but I never really considered like um, the trousers that I'm wearing, but also some of like the longer dresses are your own prints as well. Yeah. And I like opening them out and looking at all the different parts. What made you want to do it yourself? Is it just because everybody else's isn't as cool? I can't lie to be honest, it's like I've still to this day like never been fully happy with the like actual prints and stuff that we've done. Which that's I guess so that's good. just because I do it myself most of the time. Yeah. And then so you like you can't see it like objectively. But I I think guess like the main thing is that I love like screen print and like the texture of it and I just love all these kind of like traditional processes and I love like for example with the probably something in one of these boxes behind me to be fair, but whatever. Like the um doing like a screen print on like a silk satin or something and that contrast and texture between like the kind of matte kind of plasticky mm. kind of print with the super luxe silky shiny fabric and it's like it all feels like it would just make sense with like the identity of the brand and what we're about it costs a fucking fortune to do them to be honest like wow. digital print is so much cheaper you know what's the difference not... sorry uh, how does how does the digital print go so digital print is it will literally you'll have like a big inkjet printer oh, okay. that you'll run the fabric through and, and this is just by hand like, how you're doing it yeah right and it's a different type of ink so it'll kind of you, there's different kinds of screen print inks where some of them will like soak into the fabric and feel you know just very similar actually to a, a digital print will feel where it doesn't really affect the texture of the fabric mm -hmm. but like i love when it does yeah because i can feel on the trousers yeah like um, i love it when things feel like they've been like touched by like a human you know yeah um, and when there always is like slight flaws in it or you know like well, it's funny you say that because the thing that made me so shocked about it is how perfect I think your prints are the girls that do the screen printing they're like amazing yeah because when they're I, used so it, I saw it was by hand I was just like wait a minute there's like how? this is so perfect like how small the text is yeah stuff they're amazing these. they're really, and really good like you were saying the silk dresses I think it's like a blue one with stars on and do you design the graphics for those as well mostly I mean so she does it all I, I like the idea of kind of you know you dream of finding your like perfect collaborators to work with on like various different things and you know I have this idea in my head what I would love our prints to look like that we're not fully there yet but this for example genuinely probably took about like two days out of my like, usual schedule to sit and write made up newspaper articles to like yeah, funny. To I was reading point. some of them they're good like and you can like I can, as a customer when I'm looking at it I can see the efforts going into it because I'm like wow every tiny bit of text it's not just like Laura Ipsum. Like, well, no, it actually, that's tempting. It actually is like a story. So you you do see the value. You do see why you pay the money. And I, I think, think so. yeah, I think it is appreciated. I hope by everybody, I'm sure by everybody else that buys it, they can see all that effort and all those tiny details. The right people will. Yeah, yeah. I was like really you know, impressed. Not for them. Um, Thank you. So a couple of days ago, I just was on YouTube and Oscar de la Renta has put, up a documentary it was like came out that same day i was like oh an hour long oh, we just watch this oh. but it was all about their printmaking and like oh, nice. it was really cool to watch someone that knows nothing also just seeing like, people with like seemingly unlimited resources be able to do stuff however they want imagine. i love watching that imagine but like it's so unfair they were, they were having <laughs> discussions and it was like the possibilities were endless yeah. and also for my eye just seeing the stuff that they thought that like, this was shit and i was like amazing like, no it's not perfect and just being able to do things that many times over like i think imagine how expensive one scan it'll that go big too is. far sometimes I guess but then they can like... just keep doing it again and again and again to get this like it was really interesting we're getting off topic but no i want to watch um, it yeah, it's just watch on their youtube it. channel i forgot what it was called but it was like from this week but that was like just imagine what you could do with yeah. like the resources that's i think and the that's thing it. that's so frustrating it's like, like the biggest block on creatives is resources because it's like if yeah if you're given the chance look yeah look what can happen yeah it's um, so true but then also like look what you're doing you, you just make it work if you if you're that passionate about it you find a way which is a skill i do think it's you know 100 percent is a skill but it's also like it's so weird in this industry and with social media and everything i guess that the way that every brand of every size and every kind of type and every background is all kind of viewed through the same lens mm. whether it's because you're all like on the same like retail platform or you're all um i don't know just everyone everyone's feed and it's like 
whether it's a huge brand or it's a small one but that has like loads of money pumped into it or it's this or it's that and it's like everyone is like judged against in the same way and it's like I have no idea what I'd do if I did a story about anyone like ever <laughs> buying it like which is so true of like so many people and it's yeah. like one of my like favorite slightly like demented hobbies is like checking the accounts on somebody's house of like all the brands well she said she needed a hobby <laughs> she found one <laughs> but you know like it's uh if you ever are looking at something and you think how are they making money it's usually because they're not they're getting it from somewhere else and it's like <laughs> daddy yeah <laughs> usually <parents. laughs> dad um but it's frustrating i guess but at the same time it's not because you know despite what we were saying a minute ago like it is a really great feeling like people wearing your stuff but you know there's some brands out there that like will have this huge fancy PR team that will mean that they can convince the world that they're um, dressing everyone in their dog and it's like no you're just like making outfits for those like famous people for free and like that's kind of it that's why you've got to respect people like Zendaya who buys everything that she wears does she? yeah so her and Law like literally all these pieces they pull they buy it but just all the things like, I, listen <laughs> Law if you're somehow watching this you need to talk but like you say when you see like celebrities wearing a brand it they doesn't necessarily mean the brand is for it. you know so it's how much return on investment is that? it's so hard because like it's like yeah sometimes somebody wears something and you really do see a response to it and then other times it like it depends what it is if it's like a, a a casual look or a bag that everyday people want then yeah but if they're wearing like a crazy gown for like an event yeah. it'll get reposted a lot of times and your name will get about but who's actually going to buy that for like that in their normal life so it's i guess so true yeah we're really getting off topic here. Yeah. <laughs> because i think we should start looking at some of your new pieces i think that's okay. what we should do yeah, but sure. i really love learning more about your business every time i do one of these i feel like i understand my brand so much more and it just makes me want to buy more stuff I'm sure you've got like, a great order of them. Yeah, and you can't put a price on that. Exactly. Um, <laughs> so, let's do this. This is the Cha-Cha corset. It's one of my favourite pieces from the new kind of little drop that we're putting out. It's proper, like, structured. It's made from this dead stock, like, pink duchess satin. And it's trimmed in this silk dupion, which I think I ordered about 10 different swatches of different, like, Dupion, Shantung, the organzas, like all different things to try and figure out what's gonna be the perfect like little frill for this to get the colour right, everything, and the raw edges that I just think are so kind of satisfying. Um, and then the tassels, which were actually made by hand from this rayon kind of I think it's like a crochet thing, really, but yeah, we make tassels now too, apparently. Mm -hmm. Um, and then if I turn around and show you the back, it has the the ribbon, which is also pure silk. Um, we're like not scrimping on anything with this um, and the zip which is this brand called uh, Riri which if you know zips it's expensive <laughs> but really really nice I just want it to be so nice and detailed what you can't see is all of the internal structure that this has it has an internal lining in the same lovely candy pink silk dupion of the frill what you can't see, you can see the boning channels kind of hinting at you here, but it has a full cutiel kind of interlining that's all fully boned with steel boning. To see, it does all of the like heavy lifting, kind of giving you a hug, cinching support of a, like a really traditional corset, but in this sugary confection of a coating. I like, I love it. <laughs> cool, that was really good.